because we have a very special guest joining us. It's true. Vincent, and I don't want to murder your last name. I always, I always say LaFerre, but some people say, no, it's LaFerrette. And I'm like, no, it's, I think it's LaFerre. You've heard them all. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, my last name is Posazidis. So nobody, <laughs> that's why everybody just calls me John P. Yeah. So, so you at know, least you don't have to deal with that. With a telemarketer call. Hello, Mr. Yeah. That, click, I, click. Click. I know. It's, it's <laughs> easy to know. Yeah. So. so how's the show going for you so far? It's going. It's going really well. Uh, I haven't been partying too much this time. I went out uh, last night and shot with a new prototype camera. I had a lot of fun in New York. Nice. And I've awesome. uh, just been taking it easy. It's did last you, day. Did you speak? I, yeah, I've been speaking every day, and I have a workshop this afternoon. Oh, nice. How many people are coming to the workshop? I don't know. Probably 100. That's not a, not a bad thing. Yeah. Not a bad thing at all. Uh, what, what, do you, what have you been working on lately? Um, I'm a commercial director in L.A. Uh, I'm a blogger as well, a Twitter guy. Um, used to be a photographer at the New York Times. I uh, worked at National Geographic, Sports Illustrated, Time Magazine, and all that. And then four years ago, I was the first person to shoot with the Canon 5D Mark II. Well, That's when I got my introduction go. to you. Yeah, and uh, as did many people. It was kind of funny that a year later, after a 20-year experience as a photographer, winning all the awards, <laughs> Pulitzer Prize, all that fun stuff, no one knew I was a photographer. They're like, oh, you're the video guy. Yeah. Just goes to show it, you how happened. the social network happens, you know? Yeah, because as soon as those, whenever Canon puts something out, it seems they put one in your hands, yep. and they let you go out and make some incredible videos. Right. And that 5D one is the one that I saw as well. Yeah. And it's just... It's, it's amazing what happens when they put it out there online, yep. how quickly it spreads. I mean, I'm sitting here for yep. the same reason. Yeah, but I mean, in it's, all fairness, it's, yeah. the, the, you got access to that camera before everybody else did. But, but I wasn't meant to. Oh, really? No. Well, I, I want to hear about that. I stole it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I want to hear about that. But what I was going to say was you also took a brand new tool, yep. and you really, honestly, yeah. from a guy, you know, we do a lot of video. Right. You did some amazing stuff with it that Thanks. just blew all of our minds. So yeah. that's a hundred percent to your credit. Appreciate it. Now, how did you get it originally? All right. Well, for those of you that don't know where it is, if you go to uh, to Vimeo yeah. or just search Lafare, L-A-F-O-R-E-T, and uh, Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I-E, it should pop up on Vimeo. Uh, I call it a bad cologne commercial. And the story behind it was that I had a meeting with Canon on a Wednesday. It got completely blown off. And the guy kind of said, ah, you know, come back next week, pick Thursday or Friday. And I said, ah, Friday sounds good. And literally as I walked into this office, these two white boxes just kind of brushed past me. And just like, you know, an animal following food, I just <laughs> followed the little white boxes to their eventual destination. And knowing full well there were two prototype cameras in there I wasn't supposed to see. And I went, ooh, what are those? The guy was highly irritated because he'd obviously not kept the confidentiality. He slapped an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, on the table, signed it, said this is a 5D Mark II. It's a DSLR. It's full frame, just like the 5D. And uh, we just threw him video in it. And I was like, you did what? He's like, it shoots 1080p video. I'm like, well, what format? He's like, I don't know. There was no manual. There was one battery. <laughs> and um, I said, well, can I try it? He's like, okay. And we went around the office in like, horrific fluorescent lighting with a 2470. And I saw the image on the back of the LCD. And it wasn't like the light bulb went on. It yeah. just burst. Wow. And I knew then and there, this is going to be a huge game changer. So for the next four hours, I just hammered them, saying, please let me borrow it. This is what I can do with it. Da 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 da, da. After right around 5 p.m. that day, I finally said, all right, you know, my, my winning argument is going to sit in the FedEx, you know, container yard for over the weekend anyways. Yeah. Let me borrow it over the weekend. What, what can it hurt? And they said, borrow it over the weekend. Send us an email on Monday. Instead, I went out to the short film, uh, short or bad cologne commercial. And uh, I did what I knew. I knew the city. I'd been a New York Times photographer for seven years, so I knew the city like the back of my hand. I knew where the good light was, where the good, you know, beautiful parts were. No storyboards, no film permits, no video equipment. I had three suction cup things to put on the, on the front of my car. I had one fluid head that I borrowed, and that was it. Used, you know, still photography strobe lights with the modeling lap and went out and shot Reverie. And then that is amazing. people are watching. I Oh, there you go. Cool. Pretty sure watching it now. That's uh, amazing. How did you get that shot? You were in a helicopter. Well, that was my one production value. So yeah. I had been surrounded. I'd never shot any video prior to Reverie. I'd always been still purely. Really? Yeah, but I was surrounded by film my whole year, my whole life. My dad was a set photographer. I, my first memories on a movie set. So I'd been around film sets my whole life. But I, uh, I knew about production value. And I said, you know, my weakness is as a photographer is always aerial photography. So I called the, the helicopter people and said, hey, can I go up for one hour? Like, sure. And I, I got two models. It originally was one, but I eventually got two. And uh, the rest is kind of history. That's cool. I, 
So you literally went from stills yeah. and jumped right in. Jumped in. Now, and I've, I've been doing the same thing. And right. it, it, I think it's, it's pretty e much easier for us still shooters to get into video. I, do, I mean, I, f I found it for me in terms yeah. of framing and composition. Yes. Now, when it comes down to the technical aspects of the, of the you know, where don't shoot at a thousandth of a second and right. keep it to, you know, 40, yeah. you know, 140th or 150th, yeah. that part is still coming along. But right. in terms of composition and just being able to visually yeah. see what you're doing, I I've, I've enjoyed doing that. An yeah, and that's what you bring to the table. That's what every photographer brings to the table, and they actually lose very quickly when they start studying the other stuff. But we know how to frame and we know how to light. We don't really know how to move the camera or why. That's a big part we have right. to listen. And then we don't really know how to sequence stuff. And that's what filmmaking or directing really is about. Is storytelling. It's storytelling. It's how do you choose a lens or a camera move or a sequencing or a choice of shots specifically to make the audience feel something. You know, it's called cin cinema language. It's called screen direction. It's called lens choice. It's, it's a whole new thing to learn. So... The, the funny part is I, te work, I teach workshops, and people, uh, I tell them before the workshop, photographers, you bring one thing to the table. You think this is all new to you, but guess what? Filmmaking has been around just as long as stills. A lot of people who know what they're doing already. So don't lose your eyes and make sure that you're happy with what you compose. And every single time, no matter how many times I tell them, I at the end of a shoot, I say, is there any single shot that you've shot in this workshop that you're actually proud of as a photographer? And they kind of sheepishly go, no. And uh, it's kind of funny to see that mistake being made again. So you, yeah. you, when you go into it, don't lose your eye. Uh, and that is important with everything that you shoot. Uh, well, we can't ask you what else you've played with that nobody knows about yet. But I can tell you what I last night I played with the uh, Epic Monochrome. So it's one of the first bl truly black and white uh, monochromatic uh, cinema cameras. And it's like night vision. It's native ISO 2000. We had uh, K35, all little Canon glass at 1.4 around the city last night, we were seeing stuff that the naked eye couldn't see. Wow. Uh, it's not night vision, but it's pretty impressive. So and you like that one? It was fun, yeah. And I've got a 1DC that they just lent me to co-play with a little bit, uh, the new 4K SLR, and I'm very excited to play yeah, with that you, one. You're going to have to get them to give you a nice TV to play it back on, too. Yeah, I won't hold my breath yeah, on that 4K one. 4K TV, like the 80-some-inch one that's over there in that other booth. Oh, They're is there one here? In, in a Sony booth. Right. There's a huge, huge 4K TV. Is it $30,000? They didn't put a price tag on that's it. That's why they didn't put a price on it. Yeah, that. a lot of them are so prototypey they can't even... They're right. not selling them yet. Yeah. No. yeah. So um, you, you, you talked about having a, a photography background and then being yeah. thrust into right. the video world yeah. just through this weird, you know, luck sequence mm -hmm. of events. And uh, since then, I think from what I've seen, you've been really engaged with a lot of video work. Yep. It's like overnight there was this huge shift yep. in your personal brand and business yep. model, et cetera. Uh, my theory is that all of us who are engaged in photography are also by definition, we must be engaged in videography now. Every tool we have involves video. Yeah. Um, you see wedding photographers now being asked to do video. You see right. uh, every kind of photographer being asked to do video. Right. Uh, what kind of tips do you have for people who are being essentially thrust and forced into this change? Right. Well, what I tell everyone is you should try it. It's, it's, it's of, of pinnacle importance that you experiment with video and see if you like it or not. And then, when you do that, realize it's not for everybody. It's a very different type of personality that grabs a still camera, goes out and finds beautiful images as a reactive person, likes to work by themselves. Filmmaking is about working with other people, it's about collaboration, it's about preparation, not being reactive, being proactive. It's a different beast, so it's not for everybody. Um, but I, I agree with you, especially when you look at these 4K cameras. You know, the 5K is a bit of an extreme with the red, epic. But you're shooting 120 frames per second of 14.4 megapixel full raw stills. So when I do my demos, I show people this. I show photographers, and I show a picture of someone's face, and I crop it all the way into the pupil, and they, their jaws always drop. And I say, it's not about when the convergence of still and video is happening. Yeah. It's already happened. It happened three years ago. Yeah. And the cost is still relatively high. It's a $70,000 package. But you have to understand that it's already happened. 
four years ago, or in 2007, the iPhone came out. Look what's happened since. So yeah, it's eighty thousand dollars now to shoot with an Epic, but in two or three years, it might be eight hundred dollars to shoot five yeah. K. You know, well, on, on even some even the GoPro. Size of even the the GoPro's at 4K. I was 4K. at the announcement last week. I was one of the five filmmakers there. And it's only like I knew they were going to come out with 4K. I told, I told Nick, I said, well, as soon as I heard it, I said, it's 4K. It's, it's insane. And it's, it's not true like 4K. It's f- between something. 12 and 15. Well, okay, yeah. But, but still, still, it's a $300 camera. Yeah, the T3. $400. It, what was it? The, was it the, T, the Canon T2i or the T3i? When they originally came out with 1080, it would yeah. only do like 20 frames a second. Right. But by the next, exactly. very next iteration... <laughs> it was doing, I don't know, maybe it was even doing 60, you know? I it, mean, it, it, w- it went like a... We have yeah. two questions for you sure. from the folks in the chat okay. in the chat room. Eagle56755 oh, asked, that. do you think videography is something... Well, let me, I'm going to ask his question in reverse. Yeah. Uh, he says, photography seems to be like it's almost becoming a little cluttered. There's just so much photo uh, you know photography so many photos yeah. available in so many places do you think video is still new enough that there's I guess more room in the market for no. it no I mean the reality is that photography has become commoditized with our iPhones and smartphones we shoot more photos per year now than our entire history combined uh, every year so we shoot more photos every year than in the past hundred years have been published um, also, uh, they upload 72 hours of video to YouTube per hour, or per minute, sorry, per minute. Per minute. Okay? So the amount of content going up is insane. What that means is it's going to hopefully be a flight to quality. That's what I learned in the New York Absolutely. Times was it wasn't the sexiest paper. It was called The Gray Lady before she went into color. But it was the best edited content out there and often the best written. And that's why the New York Times was what it was uh, and still is. Now, the same hopefully will happen with video and still content. Uh, the problem is there's a much greater barrier to entry in video. It's, you've got to have a crew. Even three people is complicated for people to get three people's schedules that aren't paid to show up on time. Yeah. And actors, that's a whole other problem. And uh, you've got to edit it. It's, it's a process. Whereas a still, you take your iPhone out, you take a picture, you send it into... Uh, Instagram or Camera Plus and you post it on Twitter and you're done and next thing you know you can have 100,000 views because it's an amazing image and that's something that has in effect um, you know cheapened the value of photography relative to where it was five years ago unfortunately I hope there's going to be a backlash I'm not holding my breath it still Um, comes down to quality though it does most of the time because there are those times where something takes off that you were just like, wow. The, the problem is some people recognize quality, some don't. It's there's been a, cheapened. Yes. And, and you know, I've, I, I've never heard this myself, but I've heard plenty of colleagues say to professional photographers, you know, some of the best photojournalists and commercial photographers in the world who had a 5D Mark II, and the CEO will walk up to them and say, oh, my daughter has that camera. And when you hear that, your heart just sinks, you know, because you know that they're judging you in some way yeah. or they wouldn't make that comment. They're just excited that their daughter has the same camera. Right. But to you, you're just like, oh. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I think that we, we actually see this. I think photography is a craft. It's a trade. Yes. And uh, we have master photographers yeah. and we have apprentice photographers. It and we used have to be much more, not to cut you off, much more of a craft when you didn't have that LCD and the instant gratification. You're right. Where the photographer or the DP on set was the only person who knew the magic of how those lights would look at, like on screen. You're right. And then when everyone got to see those LCDs on, on set, everyone had an opinion. Yeah, and just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you need to. It's worth anything, and it becomes a more of a democratic, washed-out process. And I think you've seen, um, I think you've seen this happen in many, many industries. I actually have an interesting h- hobby. I'm a bladesmith, believe okay. it or not. I'm a That's trained. Cool. I trained under four different master bladesmiths. Nice. And I can make knives and hand forge them. And nowadays, people don't have a the general public would not have an appreciation for a hand forged knife because I can go to the store and I can buy stamped ones that work. They cut anything you need them to cut. And so um, <coughs> we, we probably see that across all manner of trades. You have, you have an instance fan here because I'm, I'm a sucker for nostalgia and old, <laughs> you know, processed craftsmanship. I love going to Italy or France yeah. or Japan and just seeing crafts masters, you know, 
do you, their thing. I could show you some things that you yeah. would probably whoa. love. Whoa. Like, hey. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Again? Yeah, with, you know, <laughs> flames and fire and right. forges. And that and stuff's and fun to shoot stills of. It really and, is. And, and to capture with the video. It is. At 400 is. frames a second. Are so, you shooting yeah. the high-speed stuff right now? All the time. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's it's a, it's an easy uh, panacea towards boring content. Just shooting in slow motion, it looks beautiful. Yeah, and until everybody else catches up and they put yeah. it in a, in the iPhone, exactly. they shoot eight thousand frames a second. Now we see it at the uh, the World Series in baseball. They're yep. doing what two thousand frames a second. Yeah, I've heard up to five thousand actually. It's wow. incredible to watch. Well, it's incredible to watch just about anything yeah. in in slow motion, but especially baseball when they're when they're coming through the zone and, and rolling the, the wrist the ball over. Just like and it, you see the bat bend. Yep. So I, I have a question in terms of editing. Do yep. you have a hand, a heavy hand when it comes to editing? Are you involved? I'm with very involved in pre-planning, in storyboarding, shot listing, executing as a director on set, and I'm a huge believer in handing that off to an editor because that was my best attempt. I need someone that I call, I call myself the, can I say bullshit? Do sure. it. I, I'm the bullshit meter on set as a director. I'm the one person looking at the monitor saying I don't buy it. I need another bullshit meter when it comes to the edit. Someone's saying, I know you were trying to do X, Y, and Z. It's not working. It's not working. <laughs> a and B, look at that. Oh, okay. It's a, editing is a wonderful craft, and I believe in work. That's the whole point. Photography, it's all about, I do everything myself. One man band, ding, 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 ding. Editing is all about finding great DP, great actors, great costume designer, great uh, director, great producer, Great location manager and a great editor a great and a great sound mixer and a great composer and yep. a great colorist. I mean, it's, it's this additive process. It's the old saying, you know, the sum is much greater than the individual pieces. And that's filmmaking. So if you edit your own stuff, ah, I don't like I, it. I, and I agree. Turning that stuff over. Whenever I handed a bunch of footage. I went to South by, South by Southwest a couple years back and yeah. Nikon let me use some D7000s when yeah. they came out. Yeah. We came back with, I don't know, 30 hours of yeah. footage. I handed it to a guy that I didn't really know right. who is really good at what he does yeah. and he turned it into a four minute music video and yeah. I sat there and I was like did I shoot that? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like how did you do this because he went through all the footage and did it and that's not something that I want to do. No, I want to shoot it. it, compose it, done. And then say here, make this cool. There's creative process there. Right. We do we just do a little tech show every day and yeah. and we write a little script yeah. and uh, stand in front of the prompter, read it off and hand it to a professional exactly. editor, Dave Curley. He's amazing. Right. And what comes out the other end, I I hate seeing myself on camera, yeah. but I'll watch my own shows because I don't even know what it's going to look like. It's right. amazing, you know? Right. And, that, and, that's, and, and the last little note is, if, even if you don't edit, you should still sit in on the edit. And, yeah. and maybe shut up and just watch. Yep. Maybe give advice as you get better. But the editors will tell you, you screwed up royally here as a director. Oh, yeah. Because you didn't give me an in and out. You didn't give me uh, a nice way to cut into this. There's no, no one walking in the frame. There's no obvious cut point or you should have pre-rolled a little longer or post-rolled or you really needed to give me this other angle to cut to because when this actor flubbed that, those lines I've got no got way nothing. to cover it and you learn so much are you working on a full length right now? two of them yeah wow anything you um, one I can loosely describe as uh, I can't talk about it. it's too risky when, when is it coming out? it's a long I've, it's already been greenlit by a studio but the same studio head that said, "Go do, uh, I'll make your film for you, said, go do it on your own because as a first-time director, you're going to get killed you know, and paid nothing and have no creative control. He says, it's a great story. I love it. I want to see you make it on your own. Go find your own financing. That's, oh. that's why it's taking longer. Okay. Yeah, that is challenging. Yeah. Um, and that probably is, it's probably going to, I think this answer is going to be self-explanatory, but eMoney79 wanted uh -huh. to know, what does Vincent find easier Still photos or video? Well, I don't want to install still photos because that's where I'm from. But when I go back to still photography, it's a walk in the ballpark. It's purely based on complexity, the number of people and logistics. That being said, uh, there's nothing as enjoyable as being out there by yourself with a tripod or handheld and no one to talk to you. Whereas when you're on set on film, you've got constant reminders of how much money every single second is costing you and how many setups you have for the day. So easier is not the right word. Less complex and less logistically uh, complex is a better way of describing it. So, when it comes to shooting stills and video, do you ever go out to try to do both? Or do you find it where you have to make that decision? If you're going to shoot video, you have to stick to it and not even think about shooting stills because you're going to miss whatever's in front of you. If it's a commercial job, you have to do both often and you can do it well as long as you give yourself enough time. 
Um, I, th I don't think you can afford to have a closed mind like that and say, I only do this or I only do that. I think you have to try and, and find ways to do a little bit of both because the reality is sometimes you've got that video shot and you're, you don't have anything to shoot until the light changes sure. or something else happens or setting up a camera. There's no reason not to pull out your still camera. Right. It, it, it is more in, in terms of I've had you know readers, they sit there and they go, well, I'm going to shoot a concert and they're like, oh, I should have done video and then they do video and they're like, oh, but I should have done stills at the same time and it's just... No, you can't. If you're I don't think you can do that well. Yeah, if you're going to shoot a show, shoot one song this way. Yeah. Then That's next a, song, do this. The discipline you need is to yeah. know that you can do a little bit of this, then switch gears. But and you then already switch thought gears. about it. Right. Switch gears and back and forth. Trying to do two, you know, master of none. Yeah, because you, you end up missing. I, I learned that really early on. You're like yeah. switching from video to stills and you miss everything. Every time a great video moment happens, you're shooting stills and you switch this to video and it's all beautiful stills. And you're just like, ah! <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Hey, Vincent, cool. I, we, we're not out of time yet or anything. Okay. Um, and certainly, I would honestly love to have you here all day. Okay. You're way too busy for that. But I want to make sure before we do leave yep. that people who want to follow you, yep. who would like to get, you know, just learn more about you, but not sure. only that, but perhaps be able to get tips from you and learn yep. from you directly. How, how can they engage with you in the social media sure. and, and, and all yep. that? So. I've put a tremendous amount of time and energy into my blog. It's uh, blog.vincent, V-I-N-C-E-N-T, Laferre, which is L-A-F as in Frank, O-R-E-T, dot com. And it has an entire educational resource section with uh, hundreds of videos and examples and articles. It has an entire gear section. It's probably one of the most comprehensive anywhere on the web of every single video piece of gear that I use from beginner to advanced. So That's awesome. you want to know about tripods, you want to know about Anton Bauer batteries, light panels, you want to know about software, you want introduction to uh, Final Cut Pro or into Premiere, you want to learn how to do After Effects 3D tracking, you want to know what tripod head to buy, whether you have a $300 budget or a $5,000 budget, you want to know about motion control, you want to know about Kessler cranes, it's all up there just sitting there. And uh, it's I've got four million visitors a year that come. So wow. come join the party. There you and go. And then on Twitter, it's just at Vincent Laferre. And are you on Facebook or Google Plus? No more Facebook and Google Plus. I gave up on. You? Why'd you I give agree. up on it? He's not a fan <laughs> either. Why'd you give up on Google Plus? I, uh, I gotta ask. It just started off too slow, and I, it's just complicated. Put it here, it was in put my it here, circle, and I felt like I was mixing a recipe for disaster and. The truth is, between my family, my job, the blog, and tweeting, that's it. Okay. I could barely do Facebook. I like I look on Facebook once once a year, pretty much, see what my friends are doing. That's about it. Okay. Very fair cool. Enough. Thank you for coming on. That You're was more great. than welcome. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thank you so much. Great time. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Vincent Laferre, folks. I mean, we'll get what you. What can I say? So. Um,